Hi, and welcome to Border Crossings. My name's Owen Bird, and this is a show that focuses on issues of common concern to the communities of Palo Alto, East Palo Alto, Menlo Park, and Stanford. With us today are supervisors from each of the two counties included in our region. Supervisor Joe Simidian from the 5th District in Santa Clara County, and Supervisor Rose Jacobs Gibson from San Mateo County. And thank you both very much for making a return appearance mm. here on Border Crossings. Thank you for having thank us. You. Most uh, of our viewers would probably benefit from a quick primer up front about what the county is and what it does and what you do and <laughs> what the current issues of the day are that face this, this level of government that is often less uh, immediate in people's lives than their cities or their school districts. So Supervisor Gibson, if you could uh, take a first crack at that, <laughs> maybe you can educate us all. That was a mouthful. Um, the county is really a larger body that uh, really does some of the same functions, has some of the same functions as the city. So that's one of the quick ways of identifying it. It um, gets a lot of funds from the state to provide services to the cities and unincorporated areas within the county. Uh, has jurisdiction primarily of the unincorporated areas. However, uh, it funds uh, services for human services and a lot of social services as well as uh, health services and public safety. And those are some of the main the things that I would say that we do, that um, those are some of the main functions. As a Board of Supervisor, we are the, um, the, the policy making, policy makers. We actually make decisions as it relates to um, uh, ordinances and that r relate to the issues within the within the uh, counties, um, having to do with transportation, with housing, uh, land use, uh, environment, those types of issues. Sounds like a very broad plate, Joe. You uh, well, I mean, I, find I, I the same Rose, in Santa Clara County. Rose, as, as I think, um, hit you know most things. It's it's hard to get your hands around because it's a mixed bag. But I think there are a couple different ways you can sort of bundle it all together that makes it a little bit more manageable. One way I describe it is we do all the work that nobody else wants to do. <laughs> um, and, and seriously, I mean, we deal with some of the most difficult and tractable of social problems. I mean, welfare, uh, health care for the indigent, uh, the criminal justice system in terms of our obligation at public safety mm -hmm. that Rose mentioned in the jails. I mean, these are tough, gritty issues that really uh, no one else is particularly anxious to take responsibility for. Another way to look at it is we do sort of, we're sort of the in-between level of government. If it's uh, probably too regional for the local cities, uh, but really too local to be a statewide function in terms of its immediate operation, if you sort of think of us as that in-between level, that's helpful. And the other way I describe it, and Rose and I can both chuckle, I mean, we do what we're, we're the level of government does what we're told to do, because a lot of the work that we do is state and federally mandated. So um, we take our direction from the state or the federal government in terms of some of these programs, and uh, to some extent what we do is uh, what we're told to do. Rose, give us a couple of examples of what you're told to do and some of the current issues or controversies that are before your board that affect the uh, residents of, at least in this region, Menlo mm. Park and East Palo Alto. Well, some of the issues are, are, are regional. They're not just, they're not um, only for San Mateo County to actually address and to actually accept the challenge for. And it has to do with transportation, uh, traffic congestion, um, housing. Uh, everyone is concerned about the, the quality of education. And uh, so those are some of the, the main ones. Um, housing is good, and land use, of course. Land use is another big one. And those are some of the things that we are actually grappling with. Um, the airports, believe it or not, is some of the, some of the, um, some, of the some of the challenges and the decisions that have to be made. Um, so those are some of the ones that can come, that comes to mind immediately. Having to try and find ways that we can actually address it and and uh, make it most meaningful and beneficial for for those who actually need the transportation and got to get to work and got to get to and have to have to find ways of getting there in a quick way. And Supervisor Smidian, a couple of the burning issues of the day. In the well, district? I, I mean, uh, the, the one that is front and center for this part of the county and for South San Mateo County is the issue of Stanford lands. I mean, we've got literally half the Stanford lands are in unincorporated Santa Clara County. That's the area for which my board colleagues and I are responsible in terms of land use planning. Uh, you know, 33,000 people who are there every day as employees or students. And we're uh, really sort of front and center right now in terms of Stanford's uh, pending application for uh, land use approvals that'll guide not only what the campus looks like over the next 10 years, but really in some ways in perpetuity. So that's the topic on which I'm spending the greatest amount of my time and energy these days. And we've been, I think, fortunate we've been able to pull in folks from 
South San Mateo County as well as Northern Santa Clara County so that it is genuinely a regional mm -hmm. conversation rather than having uh, just a conversation among folks down at the County Government Center in San Jose. Now, other guests on this show at other times have said, you know, that creek is an awfully artificial boundary between us. And so, for example, the mayors from the different cities, as you know, are trying to collaborate more often. Can you give us an example of where the two counties find themselves interwoven on issues that cut across that creek? That cut across the creek? Sure. <laughs> I think and not just, just the creek itself, but, <laughs> but, but issues where the two counties um, either choose to or are forced to collaborate to address local challenges. It basically boils down to public safety, because uh, that's what actually uh, encouraged the, the joint uh, partner powers agreement was the fact that it was, everyone was involved and everyone was going to uh, either suffer as a result of it or benefit from it. So that's really what it amounts to because we would we want to be sure that we don't have uh, a repeat of the floods that we experienced the last time and, and some of the disasters that took place. So there's that's when it, it, show, it, it there's a real uh, indication of the benefits of actually partnering and, at, and, and looking at ways in which you can work together and looking at exactly what type of a plan needs to be put in place that everyone can participate in and everyone will see the benefits of. So that's, that's, that's basically one really good example yeah. of the regional, re, the purpose of re, working regionally. It's the fact that everyone's uh, going to benefit. Well, there's a land use and environment example. Any social service or um, health services? Well, there, yeah, I mean, there are, there are lots of areas where the boundary is pretty artificial. I mean, Rose, Rose's comment about public safety was the first that came to my mind as well because Rose and I actually got to know each other and be mm -hmm. friends back in 1995 when she was mayor in East Palo Alto and mm -hmm. I was mayor in Palo Alto and we were still dealing with some of the aftermath of the Palo Alto um, involvement in, uh, with East Palo Alto and others in the red team to try and deal with some of the violence issues, public safety issues. But you no, know, the issues, I mean, uh, you know, Caltrain doesn't stop at the county boundary. Uh, and so when people start talking about a Dumbarton crossing, for example, which would bring folks over to uh, our main uh, Caltrain line and the Joint Powers Board that runs that, uh, you know, I have to pr remind people in Santa Clara County that even though that, that uh, you know, that activity starts, to, starts its path uh, outside our county, that if it can take people off the highway in Santa Clara County, that that ought to be of interest to us. Um, it's, uh, um, the Stanford land use issues that I mentioned are obviously important to folks across the county. I mean, traffic that's generated isn't going to stay on the Santa Clara County okay. side of the line if we don't manage that traffic. It has an obvious impact. Some of the health and ser human services issues that we we've been looking at are, for example, uh, Drew Medical uh, Clinic, which has been having some struggles. Uh, and how does that affect the ability of other clinics? We have the May Mayview Clinics in Palo Alto and Mountain View, and can they be part of that solution or is that appropriate? Um, jobs. I mean, one of the one of the difficulties we've got in Santa Clara County is that most of the folks who are trying to make the transition from welfare to work in Santa Clara County are in other parts of the county than the area I represent. They're not in northern Santa Clara County, which mm -hmm. is job rich, but too expensive for these folks to live in. So we really ought to be talking about our folks in South, Santa Cl South San Mateo County able to access the jobs we've got in northern Santa Clara County, and are we making those connections? So it's, it, they're not always readily apparent, but uh, they're out there, and the boundary really is as artificial, I think, as you suggested. And didn't you actually at one point successfully get some funding for services that are provided on the San Mateo side of the creek? even though the, the funding came from Santa Clara. Well, and we've had, I mean, we've had some interesting uh, struggles. When I first got on the board, Rose has heard me talk about this, I was amazed. Uh, Santa Clara County had a policy that prohibited the allocation of contracts to nonprofit agencies that were headquartered outside the county, even if it was for services in Santa Clara County. And I said, wait a minute. Sounds so, if, so if somebody's in Gilroy, <laughs> we think by definition they're capable of providing services in Palo Alto. But if somebody has got their headquarters in Menlo Park providing good services in Palo Alto, we say, no, they can't participate. And the answer was, yeah, that's our policy. And I mm -hmm. said, well, let's not do that. And so we've changed the policy. But it's, uh, it shows you just how sort of rigid those boundaries can be if you let them. Yeah, which is quite a contrast from the relationship that we've had with Palo Alto over the years. Because uh, I can remember when, at being at the y, YMCA and wondering, well, why can't you service East Palo Alto? And they, within the Y structure at that time, which was over 10 years ago, um, because uh, East Palo Alto was in San Mateo County, had to be associated with the Sequoia Y and not the Palo Alto Y, which is where everybody wanted to go. Yeah. So um, it, it, they've changed that since then. 
And so the relationship that we've always had was one that which we wanted to work together because no one paid any attention to the boundaries when it came to services anyway, and even shopping for that matter. Yeah, it's a one of the uh, issues that both of you touched on as being critical to your work is the provision of uh, affordable housing. And I believe we have our first question from uh, people out in the community for you on that topic. So we can go to our monitor and see what's on people's minds. Those of you who have said that we really believe in supporting housing on the campus, we do, the environmentalists and the housers. However, with the caveat that it is critical that a major portion of this housing be below market rate and affordable to low and moderate income people. Well, clearly there was a question that occurred in the context of Stanford's community plan, but it applies equally well in San Mateo County. Let me broaden that a little bit and, and ask you, how does the county, which doesn't have direct land use authority within the cities, weigh in and participate in the efforts to deliver affordable housing in cities, even though it doesn't have direct control? Well, it's particularly difficult in Santa Clara County because we have a long-standing policy that urban development, for, for the most part, takes place inside the cities. So while other counties have allowed relatively urban development and relatively large-scale housing development in the unincorporated parts of their county, in Santa Clara County, that's just not the way uh, our land use policies work. So we've tried to provide leadership in other ways. I think you know I chair something called the Housing Leadership Council through the Silicon Valley Manufacturing Group. That's a way to try and provide some countywide leadership even though there's not a direct role for our county in uh, a lot of the housing development. Supported something called a Housing Trust Fund, which is an effort to generate $20 million uh, from within Santa Clara County that could be leveraged to be about $250 million worth of housing. Uh, serving everything from folks who are homeless to first-time home buyers to folks who are looking for affordable rental housing in the middle. Um, and our county has put uh, two and a quarter of the first four and a quarter million dollars into that fund with additional support from the city of San Jose and from five private sector donors. So there are lots of ways to go. We've got a housing summit coming up on November the 5th as a, uh, an effort to try and uh, generate some additional solutions. I, I mean, I think if there were one quick fix or easy answer, we'd have found it by now and we'd have used it. Uh, and so what you discover is you sort of have to take uh, steps in a dozen different directions simultaneously and make yes. a little bit of incremental progress. And so what we're able to do is some of that and hope that others who can, can will do their part as well. What about in San Mateo County, Supervisor Gibson? One of the uh, strategies that I've heard affordable housing providers suggest could, could, th that the uh, county could pursue would be to allow development of affordable housing on particular parcels that are owned by the county. So in that way, the county could participate. Do you think that could make sense in, in certain situations? I, I think it's something that definitely can, could be uh, pursued. And one of the things that I uh, have had some discussion on and have not actually implemented as of yet has been the idea of doing a complete inventory of the, the vacant um, parcels within, with throughout the county and looking at how we, what we might put, be able to put together that would actually address the affordable housing needs that we have. Um, and also looking at a variety of other uh, issues, um, including looking at policy and legislative types of um, um, proposals that we might be able to implement as well. Along with and along with something that having to do with the uh, housing uh, trust as well, because th we have to look at uh, as as some uh, supervisors meeting had indicated, a lot of different simultaneous efforts all at the same time, because it's something that we all have to be sure that we can do something about it, and there isn't any easy easy solutions. It's it's clear that this issue of housing affordability affects people as personally and as viscerally as just about any issue that we're facing in this region. And the stories of, of families unable to see their grown children locate here and have to move elsewhere uh, really suggest substan substantial change yes. in our social fabric that we may not be doing a very good job of managing. Have you found that to be the case in your, in your district? Uh, definitely. Definitely. 
Uh, my, my family don't even live uh, as close as they used to. I'm hoping it's going to change in the near future, but um, it's not very comfortable when you can't see your children or your grandchildren. And I think all of uh, all parents uh, have, are suffering as a result of the fact that, they're, that, it's, that it's not affordable anymore for, for young people to stay here. It really does change the fabric of the community in a way that I think is um, cause for concern. I, I just. I mean, at one level, you can ask yourself if somebody's driving from uh, Modesto or Manteca to their office in Silicon Valley every day and spending an hour and a half to two hours on the road, you know, one way. I mean, all of that is time that those parents aren't spending with their kids and their spouses. I mean, those are our parents who aren't going to make it to a little league game. They're not going to make it to coach AYSO soccer. They're not going to get to a school's uh, play. They're not even going to be able to be there for the parent-teacher conference that, you know, those of us who live close by take for granted mm -hmm. the ability to do all these things. And, you know, you can't. You can't look at that picture and then ask yourself, gee, I wonder why the fabric of the family is not holding together the way it once did. You know, here, I think there's some very tough questions, though. And I, uh, you know, when I grew up in Palo Alto as a teenager, my, my father was a teacher. My best friend's father was a mechanic. Our classmate's father was the head custodian at Palo Alto High School. All those families could not only afford to live here, they bought their own home, in most cases, on a single income. And clearly, that's not the way the city is today. Um, and you have to ask yourself, are the people who push a broom, teach your kids, wait, at, wait, you know, wait on your table, uh, serve as a clerk in a bookstore downtown, are those folks really part of the community or are they just extra help that you send home at the end of the day? Because if they're just hired help that you send home at the end of the day, that's a very different concept of community than I grew up with and that I think most people still value. Yes. And yet it, it certainly seems that the housing providers, both affordable and market rate, seem, feel that the resistance to new housing development is greatest uh, when compared to the lack of resistance to new commercial development that cites jobs that causes a greater number of car trips and other impacts. You, you can go build a million square feet of office space and no one shows up for the hearing and you try and cite 15 units in an existing neighborhood and the neighborhood uh, can get up in arms. What can the county do to try and, and, and affect that culture of resistance to, to providing housing that's so needed? Either of you? Well, I th again, I think, you know, many of these are issues it's tough for us to deal with at the county level. We're going to have to deal with some of these at the state level. I mean, part of the problem that Rose and I both face is that which gets rewarded gets done. Well, all the rewards that are in the state system uh, are for commercial development and not for residential development. And so if we're going to begin to see both cities and counties say we're going to accommodate residential growth, there needs to be some reward for that. And instead what we've got is a finance system that says if you cite these commercial activities, uh, there won't be a big demand for services that will cost you and there may be some revenues that come to you. Whereas if you take housing, exactly right. the opposite is true. So until we get that kind of change, we're not going to be in a position where folks are particularly inclined to go towards housing. Let's talk for just a minute about this issue of, of revenues, especially on the county side. You, uh, Supervisor Smithian said up front that the county is in some ways the captive of its own workload in terms of mandates from the feds and the state. Uh, and my understanding is a lot of that funding is a function of the, the count of the people that live in the county. And I know we're about to um, embark next year on, on a, a once every 10 year census. Mm -hmm. How will that play out in San Mateo County and what's its importance? Uh, census 2000, uh, that is something that's extremely um, important and valuable for the entire, all of the counties as well as the cities. Uh, the way that plays out is that the funds, the, it, it's a count of the population within each city and uh, the uh, funds are allocated based on the population from the state and even federal. Um, so it's really uh, it's significant because um, it translates into to dollars and cents, which means services to e individuals. It actually trickles down all the way down to looking at the actual services that relate to social services as, and, all, and also this, the, the paving of your streets and uh, hospital services, it actually uh, means dollars to the, to the cities as well as the counties. And the last ten, the, the previous census, there was over a over million dollars that was not, that was under, in dollars that was undercounted. Because residents of San Mateo County weren't fully counted exactly. by census takers. Exactly. Um, not necessarily census takers because there's, there's, a, there's a individual, there's, they're all mailed out to each household. Because mm -hmm. first thing that happens is that you get 
all of the households are actually accounted for. So they're long before the uh, questionnaires are sent out, they have actually looked at to be sure that they have accounted for every home. And so there's questionnaires that goes out that be mailed out in, in April of 2000. They are, the census takers go out only to those homes that have not responded. So, though, and, and if they don't get the responses then, then they are definitely goes on as undercounted. We have all these people who therefore have not been accounted for, which means that there's less dollars, that there's less representation from even legislation. Mm -hmm. I want to add that too. So it has a, gr a tremendous impact on the schools, on legislation, and uh, to services to the cit for cities as, as well, because the major A funds are are going to be appropriated based on the population as well. Sounds like you believe that it is in every resident's self-interest to make sure that they get counted and everyone they know gets counted. You said it well. My, my statement that I make on a very good, regular basis is that every breathing body needs to be accounted for uh, because it actually is going to be a benefit to everyone. And even those cities that have, have that does a good job on being sure that everyone gets accounted for, even they uh, can be impacted by the other cities that don't get counted. So everyone needs to spread the word that everyone need, need to actually respond to it. Now because Santa Clara County has a greater population than San Mateo County, is a little bit of an undercount less of an issue because it sort of comes oh, out no, in the I mean, wash? It, it, it's, uh, it, it becomes multiplied and in some ways because we're a somewhat more urban county when, when you look at the San Jose for example, um, the, uh, with a you know very diverse population and a lot of immigrant populations who are historically not all that comfortable interacting with the government. Um, no, it's a huge problem and frankly we're not having a very good first round of experiences with the census folks whose regional office is in Seattle. Uh, mm. And our estimates are that an undercount could cost uh, folks in Santa, Santa Clara County anywhere from 80 to 100 million dollars over the 10 year life cycle that a census is good for. So that's a lot of revenue to be losing that um, folks in Santa Clara County are entitled to, it's appropriately theirs, um, but they do have to be counted, as Rose said, or that money just doesn't come to our county. Give us a pro 80 to, a mil to 100 million dollars. dollars. Sounds like a lot of money. Give it's us a programmatic million. example. What well, that I mean, they, that's the money that, I mean, if you take all the things that Rose is talking about uh, in terms of bundling all these different kinds of services together, but, uh, you know, whether it's a program for mental health in the community, whether it's uh, uh, community health clinics, whether, I mean, all these, street, you know, all these are issues where state and federal funds come based uh, in some programs based on how many folks you've got, mm -hmm. and that's, it's just that simple. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a huge issue in terms of the finances involved and the ultimate implications, and uh, it really is in everyone's interest to participate and to be counted. There can't be a viewer of this show that has now not gotten that message. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> we, we have another um, question that's been taped for uh, our guests, so let's go again Good. to our monitor. In the current land use plan, there is no open space. There is not one drop of land in there that is not a candidate for development. In the actual plan documents, in the actual map, everything is a blend. Everything is, as it is now, academic reserve and open space mixed together. The proper uses that are suggested for um, academic reserve are development. I would like to see I think many, many people in this room, in this community, would like to know that we have permanent open space. People say that this is a taking to even ask for this. And really, you have to know a little bit to be able to consider that question. Normal county policy is that if you want to develop on hillside land and you do clustered development, that 90% becomes permanent open space. Supervisor Smidian, you said at the beginning of this show that the development of the Stanford Community Plan is the biggest piece of work on your plate at right. the moment. Uh, let's, let's go into that in a little more depth. This question, of course, touches on one of four or five key issues that, mm -hmm. that clearly have arisen out of this plan. Uh, the speaker spoke about the need for Stanford to dedicate in a more permanent way a portion of its land as protected open space. Do you believe that should happen? Well, I think it's interesting. I think people have, to some extent, had uh, unrealistic, I won't say unreasonable, cause, but unrealistic hopes or expectations for what we'd see in the 
uh, Stanford application. It's important to understand at this point the ball is in Stanford's court. They are the applicant. They are coming to the county and saying here's what we'd like to do and here's what we're pre preparing in the way of an application. But that's what it is. It's an application. And I I've never really expected that the university would uh, also assume the role of self-regulator and come to us with a plan that uh, basically said great we don't have to do our job now as the Santa Clara County land use governing authority for Stanford University. Once that application comes to our county on November the 15th, which is the current date we expect to see it, then we're in a very different world because then uh, the application has become the obligation of our county to, pr to put through the process and that's when our regulatory authority kicks in and then that's when we have to say thank you for sharing with us your hopes and your aspirations for the use of the property by way of your application but here's what we think we need to talk about in terms of the community's interest in processing this application. So the ball will be in our court come November 15th then the responsibility uh, comes to our, our County Board of Supervisors. As somebody put it the other day, Stanford proposes, the county disposes. I mean, that's kind of the, <laughs> the job description uh, in a nutshell. And I think, um, I think it is entirely realistic to expect that our Board of Supervisors will accept responsibility for uh, open space issues as they relate to Stanford University. Clearly, some of the desire has been for Stanford itself to put to use tools that would voluntarily guarantee long-term conserva conservation easements, that sort of thing. But clearly the county, if it chose, could, could adopt an academic growth boundary at Junipero Serra. And for, it, Stanford says 10, but 20 or more years, uh, designate those lands as the functional equivalent of uh, Stanford's rear yard setback. Well, and I, you've, I mean, again, you've hit on this issue of, of uh, you know, sure, we'd all like to, to get a plan that is submitted that uh, means that, you know we can stop going to night meetings and start get, you know getting back to other issues. I've I've always felt that you know the best we could hope for was a plan that was a clear statement of what Stanford's vision for the university was, and then our county would have to do its work, which is to manage that growth and development and to limit that growth and development in a way that was respectful of Stanford's rights as a property owner and developer but that understood that there were consequences to the communities that surround Stanford and that we had a responsibility to mitigate those impacts and make sure that what Stanford was doing to maintain its uh, success didn't compromise the quality of life in those surrounding communities. That's our job description. I mean, the Stanford folks, uh, Owen, have, have repeatedly said, look, we have, a, we have an educational trust. We are uh, limited by our charter. Our lands must be put to uh, the use of the university for educational purposes exclusively. Fair enough. I'm not a Stanford trustee, however, I am a member of our Board of Supervisors, and so my colleagues and I have a different charter and a different trust, and I, I don't think it's uh, a big surprise that we see those roles differently. Supervisor Gibson, one of the criticisms that has been leveled at Stanford's draft community plan is that at, at, a, at a data level, its maps don't even uh, include Stanford lands that are in San Mateo County, which is a substantial portion of Stanford's 8,000 acres. Would you like to see those lands included, even though Santa Clara County doesn't have jurisdiction over them, would you like to see Stanford addressing the relationship of its lands in San Mateo County to its lands in Santa, Santa Clara County in this plan? You mean San Mateo County? Ye yes. yes, I definitely think that would be appropriate. And one of our plan directors are, is attending those meetings as well, and I'm sure there's going to be there are there is some communication that's taking place uh, to to be sure that that's actually addressed. I don't know to what extent at this point because I haven't talked to them personally, but I do know that there are, that it has been brought up and and, and that they're actually going to be um, having some discussions about that. Santa Clara County has referred this plan to what feels like uh, every jurisdiction under the sun <laughs> uh, for, for review and comment. Will your board also be taking a look at this plan? You know, I really hadn't given any thought, but I'm sure we probably will. Yes. Given the fact that we have some, that, that we have some interest, should have some interest in it as well. That's a border it crossings kind even, of question, Supervisor yes, Yeah, No, I think, um, actually, I've had informal conversations both with Rose and with Supervisor Rich Gordon, whose uh, district also um, is, borders. Is, is borders, right. the, borders the area. And Rose and I have talked, uh, and Rich and I have talked informally. I've also been in touch with Terry Burns from the Planning mm -hmm. Department at uh, San Mateo County that Rose needs. alluded to. Um, whether or not there needs to be formal consideration by the San Mateo County Board in some way, I really, I leave that to them. We've certainly built time into the public participation schedule so that uh, folks in Menlo Park can be having public meetings as they have been, uh, so that folks in Portola Valley can be having public meetings as they have been. 
We've, I mean, some of these things are very simple. We've brought the documents uh, to the North County and Santa Clara County and to South San Mateo County so that if somebody wants to find the documents, they don't have to drive to San Jose uh, just to take a look at uh, any of the planning documents. But each of these other jurisdictions will participate the, to the degree they want to and in the way they want to, but I felt that what was most important was that we make that opportunity available uh, at various times in the process. At the end of the day, though, uh, and this is what I think has been good about the relationships, you know, we have the responsibility in Santa Clara County. I mean, the, not only the authority, but the obligation uh, mm -hmm. and the accountability rests with us for our, the acreage. Um, we've been, I think, able to, in this process, make sure that we do that without blinders on and making sure that what we're doing there is uh, part and parcel of a discussion about the, the whole area that, that is affected. So, so far, so good, I think, on that piece. Yes, we haven't heard any, we haven't had any reports of any um, significant um, issues that we need to actually have if, that would allow us to have, have any agendized meeting to discuss it at all. So I want to be sure and uh, clarify that. So, and I would have expected that would have taken place by now. Well, given the high visibility of this subject, it won't surprise you that we have yet another question sure. about the community <laughs> plan. Whose responsibility is it to provide school sites for the children in the Palo Alto School District, the Board of Education, and the district, of course? There are many options, none immediately popular, but for example, the most common solution is to run year-round schools in the state of, Col of California. That's one option. Another, we're sitting in a multipurpose room of a building that belongs to the Palo Alto Unified School District and is leased to the community. We can certainly speak to the community, to the city council, about taking Coverly back. Foothill College has been a great asset. Uh, dancers, artists, and many others enjoy this site, and uh, the community is not really eager to provide this site for uh, schools, although it belongs to the district. Stanford has been asked to provide a school site, and the response has been, why us? The site is the school district's problem in private conversation. In public pronouncements, we hear we will collaborate with, we will discuss, we will study, we will work with, but never we will provide land for. Why might Stanford consider providing land for the Palo Alto Unified School District? Because currently 500 students attend district schools from the campus. The district pays $7,000 per year, of which 75% comes from property tax and from the utility tax. No other school district, in my knowledge, is asked to provide anything comparable to the free education that the Palo Alto Unified School District is providing annually. We ask Stanford to consider the tremendous drain that your students make on our operating budget. It is my perception that Palo Alto may be asking Stanford to compensate for their own poor planning and foresight a number of years ago. If we're looking for scapegoats, let's go back and find those school board members and city council members that sold off all those school districts and mortgaged away our future. It is my perception that Stanford has acted very responsibly and generously to all stakeholders with respect to land use planning and construction and open space. And with far more foresight and planning and goodwill than Menlo Park or Palo Alto. Well, speaking of former school district members, and former council members. And former council members. Uh, Supervisor Simidian, this issue of whether or not Stanford has an obligation in the community plan to provide a site for a new middle school for the Palo Alto Unified School District is clearly at the top of everyone's agenda. Yeah. I think it's important to, just, uh, to be clear about what the word provide means. Stanford uh, cannot be required to, uh, to give a site to the Palo Alto Unified School District, nor can our county board require that even if our county board was prepared to do that. What our board can do, however, is make sure that as part of a comprehensive community plan that lays out the plan for the 4,000 acres in our jurisdiction is that a school site be identified. 
Um, and there's a big difference between asking someone to say, show us where you're going to set space aside for a school as part of a community plan, as opposed to asking them to actually give a site. So no one's talking about uh, Stanford being asked to give a site. What is being talked about is the need in the context of 8,000 acres overall, 4,000 Santa Clara County, to identify a school location. And you know, in fairness, uh, Stanford has uh, recently approved more than a thousand units in the city of Palo Alto on their campus uh, at the Sand Hill property. They've proposed almost another 3,000 units on the campus. So you can't really talk about 4,000 additional units of housing and not talk about mm -hmm. what kind of impact that's going to have on schools. I also think that while a lot of those units are going to be geared towards graduate student housing where there may not be youngsters, you know, those are going to be folks who move into those units on campus, freeing up units here in the Palo Alto Unified School District and surrounding areas that will be filled by folks who bring schools, uh, school children rather, into the community. So there's clearly a connection. I'm optimistic we'll work it out. These things always have a uh, little give and take and unfortunately they even sometimes have a little bit of push and shove, but I think we'll work it out. Well certainly one tool that the county could use would be to uh, create implementing zoning to implement the community plan that would that would zone a site exclusively for K to 12 instructional yeah. use. I think it's I think it's not a good idea to get too hung up on which tool. There's a lot of discussion among sort of uh, community activists and planners and Stanford officials about this tool or that tool. I don't think the public is really all that concerned about, you know, which tool we use to fix the problem. They're mostly concerned about do we provide protection for open space? Do we provide some means to limit traffic? Do we provide a housing uh, mitigation of some sort? Do we take care of school issues? And can we still let Stanford be a fine university while we're doing all that? I think we can do that, and I think we'll have some debate or discussion about which tool or which vehicle or which means we use to get from here to there. But I think the starting place is to say all of those are laudable goals. Well, that's what we want to do if we possibly can. Well, education is not an issue of exclusive concern to the residents of Santa Clara County. So before uh, I, I want to turn in just a moment to Supervisor Gibson and speak about impacts on the San Mateo side. But first, we need to take a break for a brief message. You're tuned to Border Crossings here on Impact. Being a parent is a is a joy. You have days of absolute bliss that you thought you could never ever experience. And then there are days that are so low, you wonder why you ever became a parent. Matthew Shepard. You know, in, in a perfect world, because your child is gay, you don't worry about their safety, you would just worry about them being happy. I loved Matt just the way he was. Just the way he was. We're back on Border Crossings with Supervisor Joe Simidian from Santa Clara County and Supervisor Rose Jacobs Gibson from San Mateo County. We were speaking before the break about education issues relating to the uh, Stanford Community Plan, but in San Mateo County, you listed at the top of our show mm. that education remains one of the, the issues of concern to your constituents and, and a concern of the counties, even though the county doesn't have direct jurisdiction over the schools. How does the county express its support for our public education system? Actually, by, uh, by partnering with the school districts and, any, and agencies uh, that, that actually provide educational services to, our, to the, our, our youth, our children. So that's one of the things, one of the ways in which we do that. Uh, the county has partnered in Redwood City with several of the schools in uh, Garfield, one of the charter schools, as, as well as um, a couple of others within, within the, the uh, Rip, Redwood City um, Elementary School District. So that's one good way of doing that. And I, I, one of the reasons why I consistently use, state that education is of concern is because I think all of, our, all of adults should have a concern about the education because our children are our future and we really do have to be sure that we all keep it as a, as a high priority. Uh, and find a ways that we can actually be sure to enhance and to improve the quality of education. So that means partnering as related to the county officials because we don't have jurisdiction over the school districts. Give us an example of one of those partnerships. What sort of role does the county play? Actually, generally it's providing funds, mm -hmm. providing funding to a school district uh, or a school that is in need of, 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 of providing services. Uh, the San Mateo County uh, partner with our, our school district and, and uh, Daly City to provide after-school programs. 
Uh, we also have a partner. It's a, it's a partnership with Daly City, uh, Foster City, and I think in San Mateo, along with Redwood City, and um, which covered the Garfield School, which is a charter school, and a couple of others that doesn't come to mind immediately. But that's generally the way way it's done is by partnering with the school districts uh, to actually provide the services and also. Uh, other agencies that do after school tutoring and mentoring and that, and that kind of thing. So those are the ways in which we can at best address it. Um, and of course I'm looking for other creative ways that I can uh, implement programs too because service learning is one of the things I think that needs some att special attention. And so I'm looking, I'm in the midst right now of, of uh, drafting a proposal that will address that in, within the district that I represent. So uh, we'll be talking about that in more details in the future. But there are things I think that we can do, but it has to be done in more of an innovative way and usually generally in partnership with an agency or within the school districts and where there's a willingness and there's an actual partnership that's been established and developed an agreement that we want to work on this jointly and not a matter of make, basically kind of pushing your way in and saying, I have a concern about this issue, so I'm going to be sure that we do this. Um, it really makes a big difference when you do it that way. Supervisor Sumidian, does Santa Clara County pursue similar partnerships? We do, um, and it's interesting because I think as Rose was describing it, I was thinking we went back to this conversation about artificial boundaries. I mean, most <laughs> parents don't really care which agency of government gives their kids what they need. They no. just want to make sure that their kids get what they need. Um, one of the programs that we've got is something called Schooling Services, which I've, I've been sort of push, push, pushing on since I got on the board, and I, I feel like we're getting some good results. It's an effort to bring various county services directly to school sites in Santa Clara County. And, um, you know, if you stop and think about it, when I talk to teachers now, even when I was on the board some years ago, the, the ask them, so what's the big difference between when you started 20 or 30 years ago and today? And they say, you know, I used to just have, all I had to do was walk in the room and teach. Now all of a sudden I've got to be a truant officer, a drug and alcohol counselor, <laughs> a school nurse, I've got to be a social worker for my kids. Well, if you think about that, all of those are services that the counties provide. And the kids and their families, in my view, are much better served if you bring the services to the place where they really have some sense of community, some sense of identity, where you find hundreds of kids collected on the natural, rather than saying, well, that's great that that's your community, but we really want you to go to four other county buildings to get the services you need. Let's pull those services together, bring them to the school. I think you can end up actually saving money because you've eliminated some overhead. I think you'll do a better job of serving more families. I think you'll actually lift the burden off teachers so that they can get back to class from teaching, which is what drew most of them mm -hmm. in the classroom in the first place. How hard has this been to do? Have there been institutional barriers there, to there delivering have been, the services we, you on know, the we've, we've, um, I think you know, different bureaucracies, frankly, have trouble understanding how other bureaucracies work. And that requires some time and some patience and some sensitivity. Uh, but slowly but steadily, we're finding that you know, that partnership is working in more and more districts. We've been able to fund it the last couple of years have been a little bit easier for us. We haven't had quite the troubles we had when the recession was still going strong. So we're, we're, we have both the resources and also now the will, I think, to make that work. And I'm, I'm pleased with the success we've had so far. Yeah. I was just going to add, uh, I had mentioned the, um, the uh, partnerships with the school districts. Um, but in addition to that, the uh, Sheriff's Department also has programs that are that like in the North Farrells area, as an example, in which they do have a community arts program that's been implemented in, in the school, which is after school, after school uh, activities and arts and all. And so there are those kinds of partnerships that, that actually take place in the, within the, uh, similar to the program that um, Supervisor Smedian mentioned, there's also the community-oriented health services that goes into the schools. Um, and then there's the after-school programs that actually provide the mentoring and the, the tutoring. You know, one other thing, if I can mention it, Owen, is uh, you may recall I had proposed some months ago, and I think we're finally about to get to the place I had hoped we would, the creation of something called the Director of Children's Services in Santa Clara County. Because part of the problem is that there are, even within our own county, I mean, we have a $2 billion a year budget, we have 16,000 employees, and there's really been no one who has both the obligation and the authority to get up every day, roll out of bed and say, I'm here to worry about every kid in Santa Clara County. And what mm -hmm. we've got is folks who have the responsibility and are trying to do good work and are doing good work running their program or their agency or their department, 
but how do you get the folks from health to cooperate with the folks over on the criminal justice side? If you've got a kid who's got a drug problem, does that mean you deal with it as a criminal issue, or does that mean you deal with it as a substance abuse needs treatment issue? And who's going to make those decisions? Who's going to be the party at the county level that pulls all these folks together and gets them marching in the same direction to the same tune? And who's thinking about kids rather than programs, departments, or agencies? I think that next month in November we will get to the point where we will appoint a director of children's services at the highest level of the county, at the deputy county executive level, which is just you know a step or two below our, our county executive, who will have that authority and who will have that responsibility. And I, I'm hoping then we can bring a little bit more focus to the needs of kids rather than sort of thinking about our organization in bureaucratic terms, think about it in terms of what do we need for kids. And if that means partnering with the school district, we'll go do that. If that means partnering with nonprofits, we'll go do that. But somebody's got to be looking at it from a kid's perspective rather than an organizational perspective. Well, it certainly sounds like there's no shortage of clever program and service ideas out there, but it sounds like one of the challenges that both your agencies face is delivering those programs effectively and delivering them in a place and, and in language and in ways that, that the clients can actually access. Has that been your experience in San Mateo County, that, that the challenge is bringing it to the people who need it? Uh, actually, it's more, I would say that to some extent. I think the biggest problem, the biggest challenge is, is oftentimes is having, is making sure that our constituencies are aware, aware that the services are there because there's a lot of programs and a lot of county staff are part of actual services that are available within the communities but they're not quite sure. They're not quite, they don't always know that they're there. Mm -hmm. So that the communication, getting to make sure that they are they, they know to come and that and that and to receive those services I think is one of the biggest bigger challenges. Um, so that's that's one of the bigger ones. Because we've done a really good job on partnering with uh, city agencies um, and being able to provide services and it's a matter now of just getting the word out that the um, the means by which we provide those services are, uh, have been in, improved. Uh, the communication has been improved uh, because the people all, oftentimes are fearful too of some of the agencies that they have to make contact with. So I, there's a lot of different dynamics that, are, that, that we've been working on over the years that have actually improved, but yet we have to get the word out now to our constituents. What about getting the word out in the 5th District? There, some have a perception that, that in the 5th District of Santa Clara County, uh, life is so affluent that there aren't as many people yeah. who need county services. Is well, that true? Well, um, it has been a struggle. Uh, there are a lot of obstacles to sort of fully integrating the 5th Supervisorial District, which is the northwest part of Santa Clara County, into the mainstream of uh, Santa Clara County activities and participation. Um, I have. I have been surprised, actually, Owen, at the extent to which I have been a district supervisor. And I very quickly realized that it, if I didn't make the case for my folks, nobody else was going to make the case for my folks. Mm -hmm. And so um, I've been uh, pretty aggressive about that. My colleagues, for the most part, have been uh, responsive to that. Supervisor Blanca Alvarado, with whom I serve on the Children and Families Committee, is uh, the representative for East San Jose. Now, they've got a level of need that far, far eclipses what we've got in my area. But she's been very supportive and a very gracious colleague about saying, you know, let's not forget the folks in northern Santa Clara County when those opportunities have come along. And it has made a difference. I mean, uh, we've expanded uh, the services available at Mayview Community Center, the health services in uh, both Mountain View and Palo Alto as a result. We've been able to keep uh, the staff proposed at one point that we move the only welfare office in my district out of my district. And I said, no, 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 no. It's hard enough for poor folks to continue to make their way in my district, given the cost of living here, without yanking any support whatsoever out from underneath them. So it has been um, a part of the job that I think I had, frankly, not anticipated. And uh, I feel good about the fact that being an advocate for my district means that the needs we do have here are recognized. And finally, I just say this, I argue that it's actually tougher to be a person of modest means in an affluent area because the perception and the expectation is just what you said. Mm -hmm. The infrastructure is there in some other places because folks know that the means aren't there. But if you're, if you're a person of modest means in a very prosperous area like I represent, mm -hmm. you can get overlooked pretty easily. Mm -hmm. And that affluence, of course, is also found in portions of your district. Do you sometimes find that delivering services in those portions of the district um, include some of the challenges that Supervisor Simidian mentioned? Yes, definitely. Because um, my district includes Miller Park, East Palo Alto, um, Redwood, Redwood City, which includes Redwood Shores as well, and the North Fair Oaks area. 
and that I do get some of that, but not as not quite as, as as much because we focus so much on the needs that we that I have within those who are actually are in the most the most need. Yeah. Now, another, just being in I'm sorry, uh, no, just sorry. being in San Mateo County, there is a stigma that we have money, so that's mm -hmm. always a, a, just a general issue. You both did a terrific job up front of, of giving viewers examples of the range of policy issues that counties address. Yet Santa Clara County recently dipped its toe in a subject that is not routinely on the agenda of local governments, and that's foreign policy. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> well, it's, it, was, there were, it was ironic uh, because I actually am a person who has uh, quite a bit of interest in foreign affairs and international relations, as you know, and, but uh, we had two... Uh, two resolutions that were brought to, brought to our board. Uh, one was to uh, support lifting sanctions in Iraq, and the other was to uh, support the extradition of Augusto Pinochet uh, of Chile. Uh, and, um, you know, people felt very strongly, passionately, had heartfelt opinions. Um, they're important and significant issues. Uh, I made the case that this was really not within the purview of our board. Um, and it does not in any way diminish the importance of the issue or the legitimacy of the concern. Uh, I just took the view that uh, really um, it, it had the potential to quickly politicize our board. It had the potential to involve us in subjects for which, frankly, we have neither the training or the staff uh, to respond uh, and that we ought not to go down that path unless it involved some action by our board. Um, it ended up being, I would say, a pretty split decision. Uh, the board uh, did vote uh, to uh, support lifting uh, sanctions in Iraq by a vote of three in favor, none against, and two principled abstentions, of which one was mine. Uh, on the issue of Pinochet, I was a little bit more uh, successful in my point of view. I pointed out that we were talking about uh, the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors is giving direction to the American ambassador regarding a Chilean national currently on British soil uh, who had been uh, uh, the subject of an extradition request by Spain and that this was in fact really a legal issue uh, rather than a policy issue at any rate. And so that effort failed uh, two in favor, one against, two principled abstentions including my <laughs> own. Uh, but it was, an, it was an interesting discussion. It really, uh, it had to do with I thought the importance of focusing on the task at hand. We have no shortage of challenges in the county, and as I say, uh, the irony is that I am probably one of the board members most interested and involved in foreign affairs, but uh, I waged a year-long campaign, and no one asked me a question about foreign affairs when I was a candidate because no one really thought that's where I was going to be putting my time and energies. Different, I would have a different view if it were a question about uh, for example, the 400,000 immigrants who are in Santa Clara County. Very different issue. Then it becomes real and tangible and part of my job description. Uh, I have lots of opinions about the INS, for example, and how they are or are not responding to the need to move folks through the citizenship process who have met all the requirements. Um, then it becomes a very tangible and direct uh, kind of county issue. But um, on these others, it seemed to me there was no end to the number of foreign policy issues where we might weigh in, and uh, it seemed to me a bad, bad precedent to set. Supervisor Gibson, the County Board of Supervisors in City and County of San Francisco, City Council in Berkeley, others um, uh, take positions and engage in what some call municipal foreign policy. Is this something that the San Mateo Board of Supervisors would ever consider? I won't say that we haven't considered, we, it wouldn't be considered up to this point though, since I've been on the board, we have not taken any of those uh, items as part of our agenda and dis discussions. Uh, and I, I don't, that's not to suggest that we're not interested in foreign issues, foreign policies. It's just something that we haven't actually um, have, have any discussions about it at this point. Well, we've got just a couple of minutes left, and what I'd like to do is ask both of you about your experiences serving as a supervisor. In San Mateo County, you, of course, came from the City Council in East Palo Alto. You're intimately involved in your community there. How has the role and your own day-to-day -day experience changed? <laughs> Dramatically, um, but very positively. I, I have been really, really um, pleased with um, the, um, the new position, I would say. It's, it's more than what I ever expected, and uh, I've been very well received throughout the county. I really enjoy getting to know the county in a way that I never had before, um, and, and looking at 
the the full county, which which is very very broad and gets larger as you travel around. But um, there are cities that uh, felt somewhat like East Palo Alto had within the county that they they kind of set set apart. Um, the farther away they are, they, the least they feel that they are paying attention to. And I have made a point to be sure that I listen to those concerns that they have as an example of on the coast side and Pacifica and those those cities that are farther apart away and um, learn that they are experiencing some of the, some of the same similar challenges as far as development that I was I'm familiar with having gone through the, the development process in East Palo Alto so that has been very uh, good for me to be able to be in a position that I can listen and also uh, offer some suggestions and, and then make policy decisions as a result of it um, the issues in, of, the, of the county have been very broad and, and I have been very very excited about the opportunity to really look at, at began to really do some things that are very, very tangible, like uh, coordinating the housing policy legislation and uh, addressing the Section 8 issues that a lot of, the, a lot of the, my constituents have had that had been given a lot of attention to before and, and having a meeting and being able to do some follow-up on that. So it's been a very positive experience, and I'm really enjoying it and looking forward to uh, continuing to serve. And Supervisor Smidian, you lived, worked, and served in Palo Alto for many, many years, and now you have found yourself for the past few years getting on the freeway every morning down to San Jose. How's yeah. that been different? Well, it's been different in a number of ways. I, I alluded to the fact that I, in our system of pure district elections in Santa Clara County, there are 340,000 people in my district, and I am the only member of the board of supervisors they've got and so I you know I, I, I found I really have had to be a district advocate in a way I had not anticipated um, coming from a relatively prosperous area in northern Santa Clara County um, I think that while I've always had a uh, an understanding and an empathy and an intellectual commitment to sort of issues of economic and uh, racial and ethnic diversity my clients now are genuinely diverse. I work in a much more diverse environment in terms of the issues that I have to grapple with. I'm, I'm dealing with the sort of 10 percent of folks at the bottom end of the socioeconomic spectrum who really are in uh, uh, a tough spot and that's been a wonderfully uh, sort of eye-opening experience for me that I'm, I'm very very glad I've had. I, I think it's been, um, I think I've grown as a result quite frankly. Uh, so that's been part of it. I have been struck by how easy it is to sort of lose touch with your uh, hometown roots just 15 miles away you have to make a uh, you know a you have effort. to make a conscious effort mm -hmm. uh, to uh, you know I have eight different cities in my district and, um, and every one of which is unique every one of which thinks their problems are uh, or should be at the top of my list and uh, you know they're absolutely right their problems are unique and they should be at the top of my list but it, it means that I am not quite as uh, naturally connected to my own hometown unless I make an effort. So well, I, have to I see. But I see you going out for a burger at the same places periodically. That's, that's you right. You haven't but evaporated. It's, but it's work. No. In fact, <laughs> I wish a little of me would evaporate. Always, but uh, but it, it's work. And it, you know, it used to be sort of quite natural and comfortable living and working in the same town and representing folks where you'd grown up. Uh, now it's uh, it it really does require a conscious effort to make sure that you stay connected with with your own hometown and sort of don't forget sort of who you can who you are and where you came from. Well, I'd like to thank both of you very much for taking this time today and want to uh, let our viewers know that Supervisor Simidian can be contacted at the Board of Supervisors in San Jose uh, with a local phone number, though, 965-8737. Supervisor Gibson can be contacted at the Board of Supervisors for San Mateo at 363-4570 in Redwood City for constituents who want to follow up on any of the issues we've addressed here. We very much appreciate you taking the time to appear on this show because of its look at, at issues that intersect our, uh, around our region. It's especially helpful to have uh, supervisors from both our counties here. So Supervisor Smitty and Supervisor Gibson, thank you very much for joining us today. You. And you have been here with us on border crossings here on Impact. Thank you very much. <laughs>